So if everything is good and you all can hear me, I will go ahead and get started with this. Uh, let's see. Okay. Resist not evil, freedom versus force. So again, our theme to be like him, being changed by the glory of the Lord, beholding God's glory from glory to glory as by the spirit of the Lord. Maybe you all have heard this quote from Muhanda Gandhi. Right? He was he's famous for saying, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Why? For your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So, and yeah, he was, I think he was a Hindu of the Hindu um, persuasion of faith. Um, so what, what, I, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with all of these faces. I just gave one of them away. Um, are y'all familiar with the guy on the left and the guy on the right? Um, what do all of these men have in common? What is, what is something, uh, similar that they have in common? Does anybody have a guess? Does, uh, does anybody in the chat box, let's see, want to, want to, does anybody have a guess on what, what they all have in common? The guy on the left is Martin Luther King Jr., guy in the middle, Gandhi, and the guy on the right, Leo Tolstoy. Do we have any guesses? <laughs> all right. Well, I'll share then. Um, believe on something. <laughs> yes, say this. they all believed in something. That's for sure. They have all believed in this principle. Some of them may have been uh, more believers in God than others, but um, or different views of God. But they all believed in this idea of non-resistance, of non-violence. So that's something that they all shared. And uh, Tolstoy, um, actually Gandhi learned a lot of his stuff from Tolstoy, uh, Martin Luther King as well. And, and a lot of these guys learned things from Aidan Badeau, which, uh, which wrote some principles in a book that I'm going to share with you all. So Jesus as well shared this same principle of non-resistance. Non -resistance. Uh, Matthew 5, 38, 39 says, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And I have heard stories about this where somebody is actually somebody on the cheek and they put that person's hand up to their left cheek and they said, I give you my other cheek also. <laughs> and uh, they were just disarmed. He's like, what? What? <laughs> um, so this is, this is a, a principle, right? Um, uh, that uh, this pr principle is just not evil, that like begets like. Uh, we know this in the natural world, right? Um, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his own image. Um, animals beget animals after their own kind. And uh, so like begets like. And the principle here is violence begets violence and nonviolence, love begets love. Only by love can love be awakened, as I brought out the other day. The Mennonites. Mennonites are a group. I have some friends who are Mennonites here in the United States, and they are very natural to the, uh, you try, they're almost like Amish. Amish are a little more primitive. So the Mennonites might use a little electricity. They might use some cars, uh, but they try and live very simple lives and, um, and they try and dress modestly. And um, they've, they adopted a principle of, of, of non violence as well so they said in their beliefs as regarding revenge that is to oppose an enemy with the sword we believe and confess that the lord christ has forgiven and forbidden and set aside to his disciples and followers all revenge and retaliation and commanded them to render to no one evil for evil or cursing for cursing but to put the sword into the sheath or as the prophets have predicted to beat their swords into plowshares and this is a real, um, this is a real, I'm, I'm trying to remember where this uh, statue is, but it's a man beating a sword into a plowshare. Um, and it was, it, I think it was to symbolize um, peace, tr to try and symbolize peace of the nations. So Gandhi also had another quote here, right? If, if everyone followed an eye for an eye, it would make the whole world blind. <laughs> so um, thankfully not everyone follows that to, to the, to its, uh, yeah. So love your enemies, right? Matt, Jesus said in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, 
so that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And I actually wanted to quote the other verse. I, uh, but this is still a good one. It still brings the point. But pray for those who despitefully use you. And um, and so we need to love our enemies. Pray for them. And um, and 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 a few verses later in Matthew five forty eight, Jesus then says, "Therefore ye shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect." In another place, I think in Luke, in the 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 story that's the the place where this similar uh, wording it says. And you shall be merciful as your father in heaven is merciful. So then set up perfect. It says merciful in another place in the gospels. And so God's mercy, his perfection of character in, in us is really one of the final places of character development is really, truly being able to love our enemies and pray for them. And uh, so may God help us. Uh, it's hard in the moment. We might say, okay, I can do it now, but it's when we're going through it, it really is hard, but. God will give us strength. Romans 12, uh, Paul brought out some really beautiful principles on this. He said, bless those who persecute you. Um, and he's talking about divine, what is this divine vengeance? Coals of fire, right? So bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So some people say, yes, well, well, I'm not to get vengeance on my enemies, but the Lord will. God will. Yeah, he'll, he'll give them what's coming to them. But how is the Lord going to give vengeance to his enemies, right? Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, wow, it's beautiful. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome by evil, but what? Overcome evil with good. I love these verses. You could extract so much out of these, uh, but uh, it will. the point will be made clear as we as we go on. So this is a really interesting story. Um, if you all have read in 2 Kings 6, right, where Elisha is with um is is in the is 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 with Israel and he's the king had summoned for him and the Syrian army had surrounded the city. And so there's, there's a Syrian army with horses and chariots. And uh, so the servant of, 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 of the man of God um, of Elisha rose out and he saw this arm and he's like, my master, what should we do? So Elijah said, do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Hallelujah. We can, we, that prayer is for us. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That would have been amazing. And, and we, by faith, we can believe that God will send all of heaven, all of the angels of heaven as needed to deliver us from evil. Um, if, 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 if needed, um, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. So this whole army is struck blind. I just, I'm just, if you can imagine the story, right, in your imagination, it's just wild. Okay, now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and there they were inside Samaria. And that's not where they wanted to be. Um, now, when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? I mean, you can imagine what the king is thinking here. And he's like, whoa, like, how is this happening? Like our enemies, like Elisha brought like our enemies in inside of our city we have them at our at our disposal now maybe we should maybe we should kill them get vengeance on them now while we can while we can but what does elisha then suggest to do this is amazing and think of that verses we just read in romans 12 
feeding your enemies. But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. <laughs> so he feeds them. They have this feast. I mean, can you imagine like their enemies and 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 the, the king and maybe some of the other people of the city eating, sharing, breaking bread with their enemies? It's just wow. And guess what? Because of that kindness, so this last sentence here so the bands of syrian raiders came no more into the land of israel wow so how did they defeat their enemies by feeding them amazing i love this story wow they came no more into the land of israel you're like what is going on like we better stay away from these guys these people are crazy <laughs> well crazy for love the love of god Okay, story time. All right, you ready for story time? Uh, we had a nice story from the Bible. This one's a story from the 1800s. And um, it is from it is from this book, which I really love and recommend. Please, please, I, I, I implore you, I encourage you to, um, let's see, I can actually pull it up now to, um, I, many of you have downloaded the books that I have to share. But I encourage you to um, look at the, uh, the the Dropbox that I have shared the links to to books with you all, um, and please find this book. Um, let's see, you can find this book and download it, and you can be blessed by the stories that are in this book. It's a compilation of stories from the 1800s. There you go. I shared it in the chat with everyone. And um, I think you'll really enjoy it. So these are just a few selections of stories from the book. So there, so this one's called Impounding the Horse. A man approached his neighbor in great anger one afternoon saying, Sirrah, I found your horse loose in the road this morning and put him in the pound where he now is. If you want him, go and pay the fees and take him out. And I give you notice now that just as often as I find him loose in the highway, I will impound him at your cost. And I said to the neighbor, looking out my window this morning, saw your cows in my cornfield. I drove them all out and turned them into your pasture. I now give you notice that as often as I find them in my cornfield, I will do just so again. <laughs> The first was so humbled, reconciled, sent to the pound, paid the fees, and restored his neighbor's horse to him with an honorable apology for his ill temper. <laughs> Such a good story. I love it. Okay, here's another one. The young man near Philadelphia. A few years since, a young man in the vicinity of Philadelphia, I think this is here in the United States, was one evening stopped in a grove with the demand your money or your life pointing a gun imagine somebody pointing a gun or a machete at you right demanding your money or your life the robber then presented a pistol to his breast the young man having a large sum of money proceeded leisurely and calmly to hand it over to his enemy at the same time setting before him the wickedness and peril of his career wow would you respond this way <laughs> the rebukes of the young man cut the robber to the heart. Ah, he became enraged, cocked his pistol, held it to the young man's head, and with an oath said, stop that preaching or I'll blow out your brains. Whoa, man, would you stop preaching at this point? He had holy boldness. The young man calmly replied, friend, to save my money, I would not risk my life. But to save you from your evil course, I am willing to die. I shall not cease to plead with you. He then poured in the truth still more earnestly and kindly. Soon the pistol fell to the ground. The tears began to flow and the robber was overcome. He handed the money all back with the remark, I cannot rob a man of such principles. Wow. Amazing. These stories are just, just so inspirational. 
So um, this is a this is a little um, excerpt from um, A. T. Jones who talked about self sacrifice or self defense. All right. Do you know anybody who practices martial arts or self defense? It's very popular um, in America and in a lot of Asian cultures. I know we have a lot of Kung Fu movies and stuff and you need to be able to defend yourself. And some philosophies say, well, well, you should not be the offender just going out and trying to start a, a fight. But if somebody comes at you and they're going to harm you or you or your, or your family, you should be able to know how to defend yourself. And you should be able to take that person out or knock them to the ground or, you know, whatever. But uh, A.T. Jones, he's one of the pioneers in Adventism uh, in the late 1800s. I had this to say, um, self-preservation is the first law of nature, but self-sacrifice is the first law of grace. In order to self-preservation, self-defense is essential. Okay, so you're thinking about preserving your own life, self-preservation. So you need to defend yourself. In order to self-sacrifice, self-surrender is essential. Mm. In self-defense, the only thing that can be employed is force. In self-surrender, the only thing that can be employed is love. In self-preservation, by self-defense through the employment of force, force meets force, and this means only war, right? We see this countries and countries getting in, in fights and wars with each other. It only leads to war. I like this cute little picture up here that man is is sacrificing himself as a bridge to get over. And isn't that what Jesus has done for us, right? It's beautiful. In self-sacrifice by self-surrender and love through love, force is met by love. And this means only peace. Self-preservation then means only war, while self-sacrifice means only peace. Beautiful, reason, rational, uh, biblical thinking here. But war means only death. Self-preservation then, meaning only war, means only death. While self-sacrifice, meaning only peace, means what? Only life. Nature, self-preservation, self-defense, force, war, death, occupy only the realm of sin. And that's, yeah, grace, self-sacrifice, self-surrender, love, peace, and life occupy the realm of righteousness. The realm of sin is the realm of Satan. The realm of grace is a realm of God. All the power of the domain of grace is devoted to saving men from the dominion of sin. Beautiful. So we have another story, right? You want another story? The Indians and the Quaker family. And uh, so uh, when America was, the Americans were colonizing America, there was, you know, sometimes good interactions, sometimes bad interactions with uh, Native Americans. And uh, so an intelligent Quaker of Cincinnati related to me the following circumstances, evidence that the principle of non-resistance possesses great influence even over the savage Indian. During the last war, a Quaker lived among the inhabitants of a small settlement on our Western frontier. When the savages commenced their desolating outbreaks, every inhabitant fled to the interior settlements with the exception of the Quaker and his family. He determined to remain and rely wholly upon the simple rule of disarming his enemies with entire confidence and kindness. One morning, oh, sorry, I can't read it. He observed through his window a file of savages issuing from the forest in the direction of his house. He immediately went out and met them and put out his hand to the leader of the party, but neither he nor the rest gave him any notice. They entered his house and searched it for arms, and had they found any, most probably would have murdered every member of the family. There were none, however, and they quietly partook of the provisions that he placed before them and left him in peace. Wow, this is cool. At the entrance of the forest, he observed that they stopped and appeared to be holding a council. Soon one of their number left the rest and came towards his dwelling on the leap. He reached the door, fastened a simple white feather above it, and returned to his band when they all disappeared. Ever after that, white feather saved him from the savages, for whenever a party came by and observed it, it was a sign of peace to them. In this instance, we discover that the law of kindness disarmed even savage foes, whose white feather told their red brethren that the Quaker was a, a follower of Penn and the friend of their race. 
So William Penn had made a peace treaty with them as well. Montgomery's law of kindness. One last story here I thought would be very touching to you all. This is touching for me. The Christian slave and his enemy. A slave in one of the West Indies had originally come from Africa. And of course, we know slavery is not good, but God, God, uh, it was not God's plan, original ideal plan. But uh, God, th th just see how God worked through this story um, and through this slave. So having been brought under the influence of religious instruction, this slave became singularly valuable to his owner on account of his integrity and general good conduct. Who do you think of when I went like with this? Like I think of Joseph in Egypt, right? He was sold as a slave, but he got high responsibility because of his integrity and good conduct. After some time, his master raised him to a situation of some consequence in the management of his estate. And on one occasion, wishing to purchase 20 additional slaves, employed him to make the selection, giving him instruction to choose those who were strong and likely to make good workmen. The man went to the slave market and, uh, and examined, and under his scrutiny, uh, and commanded his scrutiny. He had long surveyed the multitude offered for sale before he fixed his eyes upon an old, decrepit slave and told his master that he must be one. The poor fellow begged that he might be indulged when the dealer remarked that if they were about to buy 20, he would give them that man in the bargain. The purchase was accordingly made and the slaves were conducted to the plantation of their master. But upon none did the manager show half the attention and care that, 40, that, that he did upon the, the poor old decrepit African. He took him to his own habitation and laid him upon his own bed. He fed him at his own table and gave him drink out of his own cup. When he was cold, he carried him into the sunshine. And when he was hot, he placed him under the shade of the coconut tree. So this is that, this is that slave that was given management of, of the estate who treated this other uh, man this way. Astonished at the attention this confidential slave bestowed upon a fellow slave, his master interrogated him upon the subject. He said, you could not take so much interest in the old man. But for some special reason, he is a relation of yours, perhaps your father. So he's thinking, this guy has to be related to you. Why are you treating him so good? No, Masa, answered the poor fellow. He no my, my father. He then is an elder brother. No, Masa, he no my brother. Then he is an uncle or some other relation. No, Masa, he no be my kindred at all, nor even my friend. Then asked the master, on what account does he excite your interest? He my enemy, Masa, replied the slave. He sold me to the slave dealer. And my Bible tell me when my enemy hunger, feed him. And when he thirst, give him drink. And I tell you, friends, when I read this yesterday, a tear or two started to, to, to well up in my eyes. I, I literally almost started crying. It was... Uh, I. I just it just hit me. I was not expecting that, and and uh, it's just a beautiful story of the truly the spirit of Christ working in this slave, this this who 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 treated the one who had sold him into slavery with such kindness, feeding him and giving him drink and caring for him, and you can imagine the impact that it had upon his uh, this 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 man who he was telling this to. So the power of kindness. We may never know until the judge uh, judgment, the influence of a kind, considerate course of action to the inconsistent, the unreasonable and unworthy. If after a course of provocation and injustice on their part, you treat them as you would an innocent person, you even take pains to show them special acts of kindness, then you have acted the part of a Christian and they become surprised and ashamed and see their course of action and meanness more clearly than if you plainly stated their aggravated acts to rebuke them if you had laid the wrong course before them you would they, they would have braced themselves in stubbornness and defiantness but to be treated in tenderness and consideration they feel more deeply their own course of action and contrast it with yours then you have the staff in your own hands you occupy vantage ground and when you show a solicitude for their souls they know that you are no hypocrite but that you mean every word you say I have been shown that a few words spoken in a hasty manner under provocation and which seemed but a little thing 
just what they deserve, often cut the cords of influence that should have bound the soul to your soul. The very idea of their being in darkness under the temptation of Satan and blinded by his bewitching power should make you feel deep sympathy for them. The same that you would feel for a diseased patient who suffers, but on account of his disease is not aware of his danger. Hmm. Amen. So when tr somebody treats you bad, just realize that they're handing you a prayer request. They're telling you that they're sick, that they need prayer, that they need love. Um, I'm going to skip this section for now. I might come back to it. Um, there's some beautiful principles here, but we're starting to be short on time. Um, I want to, I want to get back to some other thoughts. Um, if, if I don't have time to get to the slides that I just skipped, you can find them in the conclusion of this book, or is this not evil? So uh, that's why I encourage you, um, download this book. I have the audio, I have the, the book in the Google drive link that I shared with you all. So you can download the book, the PDF. And at the very end, you can read the conclusion, the conclusion thoughts from the, the compiler of this book about, um, you know, his concluding thoughts about this principle of resist not evil, some beautiful thoughts in there. So um, I had come up with a little tune or melody uh, for this little poem here. And uh, so I can sing it for you now. Um, I I. It might be a little different than the first time I sung it, but the idea should should uh, should come out. Um, okay. How hardly man this lesson learn. To smile and bless the hand that spurns, to see the blow, to feel the pain, but render only love again. The spirit not to earth is given, one added, he came from heaven, reviled, rejected, and betrayed. No curse he breathed, no plaint he made. But when in death's deep pain he sighed, bring for his murderers and died. So isn't this what uh, Jesus said when he, when he was about to die? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, instead of killing his enemies, he was willing to let his enemies kill him. So God does not force anybody. The reason I'm bringing up this principle of resist not evil is because this is reflective of how our Heavenly Father feels about us and treats us. So this is why I wanted to get to this part of the presentation, because it's very important that we understand that the reason guy God is asking us to behave this way, to love our enemies, is, 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 is does God live in contrary to his law? Does he say, no, do this, but I do, I behave differently? Um, we have people in our world who want to make laws for us, but they want to live they, they don't want to live according to those laws. So God does not force anybody. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Love is an agency that expels sin. The Holy Spirit enlightens, renews, sanctifies the soul. Angels behold with inexpressible rapture the results of the working of the Holy Spirit in man. By the revelation of the attractive lovingness of Christ, by the knowledge of his love expressed to us while we were yet sinners, the stubborn heart is melted and subdued, and the sinner is transformed and becomes a child of God. Love is the agency which God uses to expel sin from the human soul. By it, he changes pride into humility, enmity, and unbelief into love and faith. He does not employ compulsory or forceful measures. Jesus is revealed to the soul, and if man will look in faith to the Lamb of God, he will live. God's government founded upon truth and love, not force. Rebellion was not, uh, as in Desire of Ages, was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And the presentation of these principles is a means to be used. 
God's government is moral and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. Get this. Force is the last resort of every false religion. And we're going to see this. A lot of times they'll try and tempt you with, oh, enticements or seduce you into, oh, you know, evil and sin. But then if that if that doesn't work, then often at times they'll use force um, and even threaten uh, you with your life. Oftentimes um, we see this throughout history. Why was Satan allowed to live? Satan's representations against this is from a review and Herald. Satan's representations against the government of God and his defense of those who sided with him were a constant accusation against God. His murmurings and complaints were groundless, and yet God allowed him to work out his theory. God could have destroyed Satan and all his sympathizers as easily as one could pick up a pebble and cast it to the earth. But by so doing, he would have given a precedence for the exercise of force. All the compelling powers found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. He would not work on this line. He would not give the slightest encouragement for any human being to set himself up as God over another human being, feeling at liberty to cause him physical or mental suffering. This principle is wholly of Satan's creation. Hmm. Wow. So this is starting to get into why, why did God allow Satan to live? Why, why did he uh, not just destroy him instantly, right? Um, what would you do if an attacker came into her, your home and he was threatening your family? A lot of people here in America, they'd say, well, I'd pick up my gun and I'd shoot the man. I'd threaten to shoot him. If he didn't leave, I would, I, I might not shoot him to kill him. I might shoot his leg and injure him or something, or, uh, you know, or I might kill him. And, and in America, if somebody comes on your property um, and threatens your family, they come into your home, you have the, basically the person legally can get away with, with, with shooting or potentially killing the person and they, they won't go to jail if it was an attacker coming into their home. But the thing is, this what is this thing saying? It's not for man to set himself up as God over another human being. So what happens if, if you shoot that man or take a machete to him and kill him in that moment in self-defense? Is it not, in a sense, almost being God to that person because you are ending that person's life, which is ending that person's probation? That person died while committing an act of sin. And so the chances of that person being saved, the chances of that person being lost um, is much higher. I would not want to be in that situation. Um, and we know that if our heart and life is right, if our family's heart and life is right with God, if, if we were to die, if they die, we know we'll see him again in heaven. And, um, and, and if we treat that, that attacker with love and non-resistance, non-violence, then is there the chance that they could repent and that they could see that love and that they would be, that they would repent of their, that they would turn from their, their ways and, um, and so, and be saved. And so, um, these are things to think about. And is God not able to protect his children without violence as well? Force must never come in. The principles of the character of God were the foundation of the education constantly kept before the heavenly angels. These principles were goodness, mercy, and love. Self-evidencing light was to be recognized and freely accepted by all who occupied positions of trust and power. They must accept God's principles and through the presentation of truth and righteousness, convince all who were in his service. This was the only power to be used. Force must never come in. So all who thought that their position gave them power to command their fellow beings and control conscience must be deprived of their position. But this is not God's plan. So could you put a gun or a machete to somebody's head and say, love me or else? Could love, could true love really exist if you're saying, you know what, if you don't it, love me or else I'll kill you. <laughs> there could not be love there. There's no, there's no, uh, there, there's no love there. Um, and uh, so God's order contrasted with Satan's order. In the councils of heaven, it was decided that the principles, that principles must be acted upon that would not at once destroy Satan's power. For it was God's purpose to place things upon an eternal basis of security. Hallelujah. Sin shall not rise up again. Time must be given for Satan to develop, develop the principles which were the foundation of his government. The heavenly universe must see worked out the principles which Satan declared were superior to God's principles. God's order must be contrasted with Satan's order. The corrupting principles of Satan's rule must be revealed. 
The principles of righteousness expressed in God's law must be demonstrated as unchangeable, perfect, eternal. So this is why God is allowing Satan to, to still and sin to exist all these 6,000 years is so that the principles of sin and of righteousness and the characters of those individuals may be played out and demonstrated, not just for those on earth, but those in heaven, the angels and unfallen worlds to see. So Jesus Christ's character completely opposite to Satan's. The Lord allowed Satan to go on and demonstrate his principles. God didn't re did reveal that his principles were right, and he carried the world's unfallen and the heavenly universe with him. But it was at a terrible cost. His only begotten son was given up as Satan's victim. The Lord Jesus Christ revealed a character entirely opposite to that of Satan. As the high priest laid aside his gorgeous pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress of a common priest, so Christ emptied himself and took the form of a servant and offered the sacrifice himself, the priest, himself, the victim. I think that's, yeah, I think that's it. So there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment or torment, which means punishment and or penal infliction. And the one who fears is not perfected in love, but praise God that in God is no, is no fear and his perfect love casts out all fear. So um, we can rest in his love. We can trust our heavenly father. He is good. And, um, and I trust that these thoughts have been a blessing for you this evening. May we be inspired to truly love our enemies and pray for those who despitefully use us that we might be the children of our father in heaven.